Hi everyone! So, as in the introduction, I previously worked at the Pitt Rivers Museum, which if you've never visited is a museum of anthropology and world archaeology, people are nodding, <laughs> at the University of Oxford. So my paper today concerns one display on the ground floor that's officially called the Treatment of the Dead, uh, and the next two slides, but only these two, contain images of human remains, so uh, look away if you'd rather not see these. Um, but this case is usually referred to as the Ancient Egypt case, as it contains the mummified remains of a woman called Itarau and her two coffins. The remains of Itarau were x-rayed and CT scanned in 1987, and she was aged to between 25 and 30 years old. Her coffins have been variously dated to the 24th dynasty, the 25th dynasty, and also the 26th dynasty. They're recorded as part of a group gifted by the Khedive of uh, Egypt, Ismail Pasha, uh, to the then Prince of Wales, the future uh, King Edward VII. The prince gave the collection to several museums around the UK, as well as his friends. Uh, so you can find them, for example, in Cambridge, in the National Museums of Scotland, the Ashmolean Museum, also in Oxford, and here in Birmingham at the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, where this coffin even featured as one of the uh, main um, adverts for the museum a few years ago. Collectively, they are known as the Prince of Wales Coffins. The prince first visited Egypt on a four-month improving tour of the Middle East in 1862. He was a bit of a naughty boy. His parents were very upset with him and they sent him away for a while to uh, learn his ways and diplomacy. Uh, he went again in 1868 to 1869 with his wife, Princess Alexandra. It was their wedding anniversary when they were presented with their collection of human remains and coffins. Nice. So, in 1965, the Sunday Telegraph, on which I can only assume is otherwise a very slow news day, uh, sensationally claimed that the find of the Prince of Wales coffins was a 95-year hoax, a complete sham, a conspiracy and a massive fraud. The article quotes Dr. Rosalind Moss and months of research, which I've not yet found published anywhere. Uh, it wasn't until 1990 that the story seems to have been picked up again. So Moss is one of the authors behind the famous topographical bibliography of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic texts, statues, reliefs and paintings, or the top bib, or Porter and Moss for short, the so-called Scotland Yard of Egyptology. The 1964 entry for the Prince of Wales coffins reports that there were 30 coffins, that they came from a tomb three miles northwest of the Colossi of Memnon in the plains of Gurna in Luxor in 1868-69, the dates of the prince's trip, some placed there by Mariette, who was the founder of the Egyptian Antiquity Service. So everything about this short statement, the date of the discovery, 1868-9, the number of coffins, 30, the location of the tomb out in the desert beyond the mountain at Gurna, and whom to blame, uh, Auguste Mariette, can be questioned. Their only source seems to be Samuel Birch, the keeper of Oriental Antiquities at the British Museum. Birch says they were found in 1868 and that it was communicated to him that they were in a tomb about 90 feet deep and that there were about 30 mummies and 30 coffins. However, he wasn't there, and he'd never been to Egypt. Someone who was there was Theresa Gray, Princess Alexandra's Lady of the Bedchamber. Only three copies of her diary of the trip were published, though, which may be why Portra Moss didn't reference it. Gray says that they were shown several mummy cases from the excavations for the prince on the 10th of March, 1869, not 1868, and that as many as 32 have been dug out. Where were they found, though? She says the next day they had a very hot ride. Yep, that's the right page. Sorry, very hot ride on the West Bank of Luxor to a tomb 90 feet deep, which agrees with Birch, which contained the sarcophagus of Nitocris, 
while Shepenwepet III, who was one of the gods' wives of Amun and the daughter of Samatik I, the first king of the 26th dynasty. So very important lady, which Birch didn't mention. Another diary of the trip was published by William Russell, who was a special correspondent to the Times. He reports that the prince and princess were presented with 30 mummies, not just mummy cases, on the 10th of March, 1869, and that they went to see the tomb they were excavated from the next day. Unlike Birch, he identifies the site as a quarter of a mile from the mortuary temple of Ramesses II, which Gray says they had lunch at afterwards. So that kind of fits. But he says the tomb was 100 feet deep, not 90. Uh, and like Gray, he mentions the sarcophagus of Nidocorus. But unlike Gray and like Birch, Russell wasn't actually in Luxor when the rest of the group were. He went off to Jerusalem on the 7th of March and didn't get back to Cairo, let alone Luxor, which is much further south, until the 16th of March. So he must have relied on what other people told him afterwards, but he doesn't say that and he doesn't say who told him. However, handily, the prince himself mentions the collection in a rare surviving letter. Rare because when he died, he asked for all of his papers to be burned. So he wrote this letter to his mum, Queen Victoria, on the 18th of March, 1869. He says there were 30 mummy cases, that the tomb was 100 feet deep and also mentions Nitocris. OK, so for ages, I was very confused about these mentions to Nitocris because the gods' wives of Amun were buried in the in, uh, sorry, tomb chapels within Mednet Harbu the mortuary temple of Ramesses III. So Gray, Russell and Prince all mention this connection. So they were buried here. So here's a map of the West Bank of Luxor. Birch says the collection was from somewhere way over here. Russell says they were from somewhere in this area. And references to Nitocris II make it sound like they were from here. But I then found out that Nitocris sarcophagus had been moved from Mednet Harbu later on, probably in the Ptolemaic or Roman period, and reused in a tomb near the village of Dar al Medina, which is over here. So during his visit in 1862, the prince was given permission to excavate an area probably around Sheikh Abd al Kurna in the middle. Uh, and in the same place again during his 1869 visit. So it's clear from reading the various accounts whoops, that none of the mummified people or coffins the prince was presented with and told came from his excavation were ever seen in situ by his group. So they were probably collected from a few different tombs nearby and not the tomb shaft uh, the group was shown the day after and which Russell alone reported they came from. Does that make sense? <laughs> they would have been smashed if Nitocris' massive heavy granite sarcophagus was lowered down on top of them during the Ptolemaic or, or Roman period. So it, it's very unlikely that they were there first and then got taken out. Um, the prince's letter shows that he suspected there was something funny going on because <laughs> he wrote that the tomb they were shown the next day had already been excavated 30 years previously. So why the attempt at deception and whom was it by? Okay, so Porter and Moss simply state that some of the coffins were placed there by Mariette, the founder of the Egyptian Antiquity Service. But they don't give any evidence why they think that. But the Telegraph article, um, in the Telegraph article, Moss, Anthony Adams of the Royal Abbott Memorial Museum in Exeter, and the Egyptologist Warren Dawson, blame Mariette and a well-known Arab tomb robber, Mustafa Agia Ayat, to impress the prince. They say that in 1857, Mariette was known to be planning another set-piece find for Prince Napoleon, uh, which was cancelled at the last minute. I think he cancelled his visit entirely, and so whatever Mariette was uh, planning um, didn't happen. 
Mustafa Agia Aya was the consular agent for Britain in Luxor, as well as for Belgium and, Ru and Russia. But he lost his job for the Belgians by exploiting a cachet of royal mummified people. It was also his house, at his house, that the Prince of Wales was presented with the collection. So maybe he had a, a link there. In the Telegraph article, Adams accuses Birch of making up a fake genealogy for the Mumfai people. He says, it seems he was more interested in impressing the royal family with his scholarship than the work he should have been doing. He must have known that his report was rubbish. <laughs> they point to Edwin Smith, an American adventurer, moneylender and illicit dealer in antiquities. Uh, who Russell and Birch, for what they're worth as neither of them was there, uh, say went into the tomb that the prince was shown. So maybe it was him. Writing at the same time as Porter and Moss, Wilson asked, how is it possible to produce 30 mummies on order, even for royalty? So I wonder, could a king for a future king Russell says that the right to excavate is a way that the viceroy, the Khedive, has, uh, has of according favours to his friends. So maybe the order came right from the top in the hope of some sort of future political benefit between Egypt and Britain. On the other hand, if we follow the money, could it have been a man called Colonel Stanton? He was the consul general of Egypt who was in charge of the prince's excavations and whom the prince paid 83 pounds, seven shillings and eight pence for Egyptian mummies in the same year. Sadly, we may never know. So, in conclusion, <laughs> always check your sources. <laughs> check your sources' sources. Make sure your eyewitnesses were really there. Remember that the ancient Egyptians moved burials around and reused burial equipment too. So they can be a complete red herring, as they were for me for ages. And if you're confused by what happened to the Prince of Wales coffins, don't worry, everyone is. <laughs> I've included my references in case anyone watching back wants to check my sources. And uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>